Hey everybody, today I'm talking about Brass Birmingham, which is a two to four player economic strategy board game designed by Martin Wallace. This one accommodates two to four players and takes 60 to 120 minutes to play. Um, however, I do think that's uh, a bit misleading. I think it would generally take a bit longer than that. Uh, this is a re-implementation of a game of the same name called Brass and um, with some rules tweaks and this one came out um, just a few years ago. So as I said, this one is a pretty involved game. There's a lot of things going on here. However, the rule set itself is pretty digestible. However, there is quite a lot of minutia. There's quite a lot of exceptions to rules and things, which I don't want to spend too much time going into. I really want to just give you a gist about how the game plays and more importantly, my impressions on it. So the board itself is going to look like this. You've got this map of England and you've got all these different cities are spaced out with all these different industries on them. Uh, you've got this market here, which dictates the prices or the supply and demand of coal and steel. You've got a big deck of cards, which is gonna be your driving force in the game. It really is a game of hand management. You've got uh, your own player boards here, which contains all the buildings that you can potentially build, the prices that it's gonna cost you to get them down, and potentially the points and income they're gonna generate. You're also gonna start the game with a bunch of these link tokens here, which in the first half of the game are going to be represented by these canal tiles because you can only place on canals. And in the second half of the game, they're gonna be represented by these train tokens. You're also gonna start with eight cards and essentially the winner of the game is going to be the person with the most victory points by the end of these two distinct phases. Each phase is going to end when each player has run through their entire deck of cards and played every card in their hand. You're going to get two actions per turn with the exception of the first turn when you're only going to get one action. Um, and those actions are pretty simple on the face of it. So let's talk about what the actions you can do actually are. So whenever you take an action, you're going to have to discard a card from your hand. Now, sometimes that doesn't really matter what you're discarding, but sometimes it will matter because as you can see, some cards here have particular locations on them, which means that you can build in those particular locations. And some of them have these particular resources on them or these industries on them, which means that you can build on that particular type of um, of location as long as it's connected to your network. The location cards kind of um, go around that rule where you can build anywhere on the map as long as you discard that particular location. So, you know, even if it's not in my network, I can discard a Worcester card to build in Worcester. Um, so I think the best way to talk through these actions is to start from the simplest and maybe get to the more complex ones after. So the first thing you can do is you can choose to scout, which basically means if you're, if you're not happy with the cards you have, you can basically discard a couple of them to pick up these wild cards, which will give you uh, the freedom to do what you want. Now you've got these industry ones, which let you build wherever you want or whatever type of industry you want. And you've got these locations ones here, which means you can build anywhere on the map. The other actions you can take are to take a loan. Now, with a, uh, an economic game like this, you'd probably expect that money is gonna be a big factor in the game, and it is. So taking a loan is very simple. You're just gonna discard any card you want, and you're gonna take 30 pounds from the bank. But as a punishment of that, you're going to move your income track three spaces down, which means at the end of your turn, you are gonna either gain or lose money depending on where your income track is. So, you know, if I start right out the gates by taking a loan, I'm gonna keep generating or keep losing three pounds at the end of each of my turns. You can choose to take the develop action again by discarding a card. And to develop, you're going to, going to have the option to basically forsake some of the lower buildings on your player board here so that you're not um, basically tied up or not, not so much wasting your turn, but you don't have to worry so much about getting your lower buildings out before you can get the higher buildings out. And to do that, you're gonna to have to discard steel, either one steel to discard one building or two to, to discard two buildings. And of course, you've got to go from the lowest upwards, but you can choose any of the different industries you want. Now, as the game develops, there is gonna be steel on the board where people build things, but you can always choose to spend or use steel from the common supply here or from the, um, I suppose, the steel house where you're gonna pay prices based on the current market value. So again, if I wanted to take that develop action and um, I wanted to get rid of two tiles, I could choose to spend these two steel and spend four pounds in order to do that. 
the network action is going to be how you're going to extend your network and connect cities to cities. And to do that, you're going to spend a number of resources depending on the phase you're in. So in the first phase, when you're building canals, it's going to cost you three pounds per connection. But in the later rounds or in the second phase, when it's the rail phase, you're going to spend five pounds and a uh, coal to build one track or 15 pounds and two coals and a beer to do two tracks. And, you know, that might sound quite expensive, but as the game goes on, you are going to build a bit more of a money engine to make that a bit more affordable. And when you do that, you're going to place your marker on either, as I said, the uh, the canals or on the, tra on the train tracks, depending on which phase you're in. And you're going to have to, well, initially you can build anywhere on the board, but from then on, you're going to have to keep connecting cities to cities and um, just extending from your network. You can't just spawn out of anywhere. And, um, and go from there. It was, is about building networks and building routes. The two dominant actions in the game are going, going to be the build action and the sell action. So the build action is probably the most complex one and there are quite a lot of different exceptions and things um, how, how this rule works. However, generally it basically means that you're going to choose the type of um, building that you want. You've got these coal mines, you've got these breweries, you've got these potteries, etc. And you'll do different things um, and you are going to spend the resource here. In this case, it's going to cost me five pounds to build this level one coal mine. So I'll spend that money, put it on my token over here, which I've already done. And this basically determines the turn order in the future rounds because whoever spends the most money ends up going last in the following turn. And once you've pay, you spend that fee, you're going to place that token on a, um, on a matching spot as long as you have that card or the industry tile if it's connecting to your network. But initially, I can just spend it anywhere um, as long as I have that card, that is. And I'm going to place it on here like so. And when I do that, if it's a coal mine, I'm going to automatically put two pieces of coal on it from the supply here. Now, what that means is that if I ever end up con building um, connecting buildings here or in these connecting cities and I can trace my route back to my coal mine, then I can spend that coal as a resource. So, for example, if I wanted to build this level one crate here, not only am I going to have to spend the eight pounds, if I had a connection, let's say I did this like this and, of course, spend that additional fee, then I could use that as a fee to pay for making that crate. If the resource market ever requires to be filled back up and you end up building one of these coal mines connecting to one of these um, symbols here, then if you built that building, let's say for example, I um, spent the relevant card and built this coal mine here, I would place my three cubes on there. But because I can trace it back to the coal market, then I can automatically, or in fact, I will automatically fill the resource market back up and get the money depicted on there. So for example here, I'd get five coins and additionally, if you ever run out of cubes on a building, on either these coal mines or the steelworks, then you will flip them over and you'll get all the rewards based on that. So for example here, I would automatically go up seven on the income track. So it'll go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, which means at the end of my turn, I'm gonna be generating two income. But on top of that, you are going to, well, when it comes to the end of the whole phase, each building that's flipped over is going to give you a number of points depending on that tile. Something that's really important to consider as well is that other players can actually use your resources. Um, let's talk about coal in particular. They can use your coal as long as it's connected to their route. So if the blue player, for example, wanted to build this crate here, he can trace a track back to your coal and I can actually end up spending your coal which might be good for him because he doesn't have to spend money from the market but they can actually end up upgrading your buildings into automatically so you've got to consider about whose resources you're going to use the steel works in a very similar way but you don't actually have to be connected anywhere I think the idea ideology behind that is that steel was very easy to transport around so you can actually take it from anywhere on the map regardless if you're connected to that player or if it's in your network at all the other buildings work slightly differently where you have to be able to trace the route back to the matching resources on these merchant tiles on the outside. So for example, this pottery here, let's say I've built this one, you are going to have to trace it back to the merchant tile that, that matches the pottery. So for example, in Gloucester here is going to accept to be able to accept the selling of pottery. And if I did that, again, I'll discard a card of my choice and flip it over. But as you can see, there is an additional fee here of beer. Now at the start of the game, or at the, end, at the start of each phase, each of these merchant tiles is going to have a 
almost a complimentary beer barrel associated to it. So the first player is actually going to get that beer for free and with the potential of a bonus um, a bonus action as well, such as being able to um, develop your player board. Um, and then you'd flip the building over as you would with the other ones. And again, increase your income and generate points at the end of the phase. However, from then on, you're going to have to start building your own beer houses or your own breweries in the same method. And when you build beer, beer, um, I'm sorry, breweries, you can actually end up using it from anywhere or using other players as long as it connects to your network. Now you can probably start to see how these different buildings are going to start interacting with each other. For example, the coal is going to need steel, the steel is going to need coal, everything needs money. Um, so you're going to need to generate money in the first place, which is going to potentially require more loans. Um, but you're going to want to flip your building so that you generate more income so you don't have to waste your turns taking loans. Um, you're going to need beer for everything. In addition to the points you're going to generate at the end of the phase by the um, by the buildings that you flipped over, you're also going to generate points based on your network because each of these link tiles is going to get points equal to the number of these symbols that they're adjacent to. So for this example, uh, this token is going to get me one, two, three additional points. And that's something that can't really be ignored really because that can actually generate quite a few points. And that's going to be how the game's going to play out. So the first phase is going to end, as I said, when the whole deck runs out and you've played all the cards in your hand. All the level one buildings are going to be discarded. These um, merchant tiles are going to fill back up with the beer. And you're basically going to go again for the second phase. But instead of using the canal routes, you're going to use the train routes. Now, all the other buildings that aren't level one are going to remain on the board, but you're going to have to start building your network again. So let's talk about how I feel about Brass Birmingham. So first off, I want to say that you know, this is a really brief overview. Um, there are quite a few exceptions to those things that I've said. There are certain little minutia, as I mentioned at the beginning, that are going to throw a bit of a spanner in the works. Um, however, I'm still impressed about how the rule set is boiled down into just a few actions. You know, the build, the network action, the develop action, the sell action, the lo loan action, and the scout action. And to be honest, half of those are really simple. You know, just take a wild card or take a few tiles off your board, for example. But something you'll learn, you'll learn as the game goes on, is that the, the strategy and the depth of this game does start to um, develop and start to reveal itself the more you play it. Um, I will admit, when I first played this game, um, I was struggling to see and struggling to understand what I was doing. I was struggling to find the strategy in it. But when I went into that rail era, I started to think, oh, that's why I was doing this. And it really does have that basically that aha moment, that moment where the penny drops and you think, oh, okay, I've made a mistake here. I love the route building in this game. I think it is fantastic. I love the way that you can sponge up other people's networks. But if you do that, you're going to have to bear in mind that you might be very dependent on drawing a particular location card to um, extend from there. Whereas if you are just constantly expanding from what you've already built, then you are going to maybe build a bit more of a self-sufficient network, but going to have to be, again, dependent on yourself rather than sponging off the resources of other players. Now, that can sometimes be a good thing because the resources could be cheap. And of course, you can use your own resources to flip your own buildings over. But, you know, if the resource market is really expensive and you've got the option to use someone else's coal, then why not do that? And you can also use some pretty cool things in order to kind of block people off for certain regions. So they have to basically travel all the way around in order to extend their networks. And so, yeah, it, there really is a chain reaction of things here that I'm barely scratching the surface of. And if I wanted to go into full depth of the strategy in this game, I could be here for hours. I really enjoy the engine building style feel of things when you are generating more and more points by flipping these buildings over. And of course you are increasing your income track as well, which will fly up this track and at the end of each round you're going to generate more money, which is fantastic because although taking loans are extremely um, valuable and I would, you know, initially in the game you're going to want to do that. Yes, you're going to go somewhat on this track, we'll go down a few spots on this track and you know, lower your income from round to round, but it will give you a big cash injection to get the buildings down in the first place. But you might think, you know, why don't I want to keep taking loans? It seems like a really valuable thing to do. You'll, and the reason for that is, as the game develops, you'll start to realise that your actions do bleed away very quickly. You know, you've only got a few turns in this game in reality. And if you're just spend, spending them just generating money for the sake of it, then, you know, you're not going to get the use out of that money. So 
The hand management system is also extremely interesting. Most of them are just going to be, you know, just discarding any card. But you'll see, again, you'll soon start to realize that cards that you've just used as a throwaway action are going to come back to haunt you if you need that card. You know, I found myself um, in that position quite a few times where I've discarded cards because I didn't think I would need it, when in reality, I really did need it a turn or two later. So you do have to consider about which card you're using. I do love the flexibility of the location cards where you can just uh, completely forsake your network and go build somewhere else, maybe get another little chain going. But it all does just work extremely well. And the fact that you get two actions per turn as well, it makes your turns feel a bit more significant. And um, you're not just spending your whole turn just you know, maybe developing your board or taking a loan. It does feel like you're taking nice big crunchy turns. On top of that, I really enjoy this uh, initiative system where the more money you spend, you are going to dictate the player order for the next turn. And that can be really important. So of course, people are going to start grabbing the places that you want. You know, you might be expanding to a certain network, looking to build maybe a, a coal mine here. And then all of a sudden, the other player just jumps in by playing a location card. So initiative is very important because again, the networks themselves in terms of the train tracks and the and the canals are going to be sought after, not only because they are um, going to generate you points on the most viable ones, but because they are going to be able to um, or increase your network, being able to helping you to expand, to use other people's resources and um, all that kind of goodness. So now the box does say this game takes 60 to 120 minutes to play. I will say that's slightly untrue. I mean, in my initial games, it's taken me quite a bit longer than that. Um, however, I do believe that once you've got your head around the rules, then you can shave quite a lot of time off of that. Um, but despite the game taking on that longer of end of things, you know, taking two hours plus, I will say that I found myself grossly immersed in the game from start to finish. The time really did fly by. It didn't outstay its welcome for a second. And um, again, just heads, get heads down, engaged in the game, enjoying every single decisions and just finding myself completely wrapped up in my, um, in my gameplay. And you know what? If, if a game does take a longer timestamp, and that is the case in terms of being so engaged that I'm more than happy to take a get for a game to take as long as it takes because as long as I'm having fun, then I'm perfectly happy. Now I will say with longer with, with longer games, then it's going to be a more of an obstacle to get to the table, um, particularly for me who I don't have a lot of time to play games unfortunately then uh, it's going to be a bit of an obstacle to get this one to the table. But if I ever do get it to the table, I'm going to find myself immersed and enjoy every single second of it. The turns themselves as well are pretty quickly. You're taking two fairly snappy actions, you know, just take a quick loan or um, you know, take some wild cards, uh, build a new location um, and, and stuff like that. So the turns themselves aren't lengthy. They're not bogged down in, um, in housekeeping or anything like that. So I will say in terms of play engagement, it um, being... The, the uptime and the time investment in general is fantastic. The player interaction in Brass is mind-blowing, actually. I can barely scratch the surface about the depth and the intricacies about how you're going to interact with other players. Um, I will say this is kind of more of a first impressions video because I feel like to get or to truly understand the gears and the cogs and the thought process behind this game, you're going to have to play this game, you know, 20 or 30 times. And, um, you know, I certainly haven't done that. But I love the way the networks work, you know, what you can use for yourself, what you can use other people for, um, knowing when to fill up the market if someone's used all the coal, knowing when to use other people's resources, want to be first on the player track. So everything you do here is just passively interactive. There's a real scarcity to get to these different cities. There's a scarcity to get to the different network spaces and the links. So player interaction really is fundamental to this game. It is just injected and embedded into the core mechanisms, which I think is fantastic and is my taste of um, interaction. You know, I, I would much rather have something like this where we're all expanding on the same board than I would if, um, say, a game was just playing cards and smashing each other to bits. So I really do love the way the uh, players interact with each other as well. Uh, the scalability does reflect that as well, because in games with fewer player counts, then it's going to be quite a few cards taken out of that deck, which means that the board is going to be a bit more concentrated, a bit smaller and focused on certain regions to ensure that you are kind of competing, I suppose, over the same region. So in terms of the scalability and the player interaction, I think it's fantastically done. Aesthetically, this game looks phenomenal. It really does look how it, I imagine a game called Brass should look. It does have that Age of Industry style uh, vibe to it. You've got these 
wonderful kind of color palette here and it just it, for me it just works this is how this game should look and it just feels right to me um, the components themselves are all top notch not overly done but still good quality robust components all the player pieces in terms of their they're going to put down to pop off the board and it just sits right for me uh, um, I, I really can't complain whatsoever about this game is how this game is produced not only from an aesthetics standpoint but from a quality standpoint as well you know the money looks great the cards look fantastic the player boards are really useful I will say that at the beginning of the game this is a bit fiddly to set up, up your map but you know if you're going to sit down and play a, a three hour game or a two, two, two to three hour game then um, you know that's more than uh, proportionate I think so yeah I love the way the game looks I love the way it feels and it's produced wonderfully. So I'll try to articulate some final thoughts about Brass Birmingham. Um, I will say this game is remarkable from a design standpoint. These economic style games are really starting to resonate with me. And I will say when I first started to play the game, I was a bit concerned about how much fun I'm going to get from this one. But as I mentioned earlier, as soon as that penny dropped, it was just like, oh, OK, here we go. Now I'm excited. Um, there's, it's not often at all where when I finish playing a game, it's just the, the game mechanisms are going around my head, thinking about what I could have done differently, thinking about how everything meshes together. And this was probably one of the only games that has done that for quite a while for me. Um, it, I'm so, so impressed and just completely enamoured with how this game comes together, to be honest. I know this is regarded as one of the greatest games ever made. Um, however, you know, sometimes that doesn't mean that it's going to resonate with particular people, but I'm so, so happy it did resonate with me. I'm so excited to dig deeper in this game because it is so deep. There are so many nuances, so many intricacies that you need to dig into that, again, I can barely, um, you know, I can't articulate in a video of this, this length, really. So I will just say... You know, we'll leave you on this note really believe the hype of this game it is number three in the world for a reason um it is just absolutely phenomenal and i'm so so excited to play this one again i'm so excited to explore what else this game still has to offer i love everything about it the pacing is fantastic i find myself grossly immersed from start to finish and um it is just a phenomenal phenomenal game and one of the best games i've played in a long long time i hope you've enjoyed this video i hope it's been somewhat of a use for you if you've been on that fence with brass birmingham like like i was to be honest I don't know what stopped me from pulling the trigger with this one, but I was hesitant to try it. But now I'm just so relieved that I have done because this game is phenomenal. This one comfortably gets my Elite Shield, just the best of the best. This is Brass Bergam. I hope you've enjoyed the review. If you have, please hit like and subscribe to my channel and check out my other videos too. For everyone else, I'll see you next time on Chairman of the Board. Bye.